This and welcome. Now, this is the fourth series, the fourth series for the history uh, series at the Royal Brisbane Women's Hospital. I'm Tammy Fatinos. I'm going to be your MC tonight, and we're going to have a wonderful evening. Firstly, um, I mean, it's a pleasure to see everyone here, and I do want to acknowledge the traditional owners of, of the land that we are having this history series, both past, present, and future. So, thank you all for joining us here tonight. Um, I've been part of the RBWH for 32 years. I know um, I may look probably a lot younger than the audience right here, but um, it's been a, it's a great opportunity that we have such wonderful guests um, that have joined us here tonight and who've made a special trip. So thank you very much. Now we have some wonderful, fantastic guest speakers tonight. We've got Cliff, Professor Cliff Pollard and Professor John Pern. So we're very interested to hear what they have to say tonight and they've prepared some wonderful talks for us tonight, which I'm sure we'll very, um, be talking for some time. So we sincerely thank them for their time and their, and their valuable time. They've got so much history. Um, I was just talking to both of them actually and I was asking them what their combined ages are because I know we're talking about the 150th year. <laughs> I'm not really sure. I think um, I know Cliff's age, and I'm not going to ask um, John Pern, but it actually pretty close, or even if not more than 150. But then I'm looking around, thinking if we combined all our ages, let's yeah, we won't go there. Um, we've got. Uh, we do need to thank our um, sponsors, um, QBank. So we're grateful that you've chosen um, the you know um, Royal Alumni to support this evening, so um, it's great because if we didn't have our sponsors, QBank, we wouldn't be able to run these series, so thank you. Um, so as you know, we, we're here to unearth some more of the fascinating stories and pining history of the hospital, and this is the fourth part, and I know some people have come for every single one and, and they've thoroughly enjoyed it, so I know we're gonna have a great night. Now, this is the oldest and the largest hospital um, in Queensland, and we have thousands of people that have been employed um, here from all um, disciplines. I won't go through, because I'll probably miss um, the disciplines, but it's been a fabulous, fast-growing population. Now, we did talk, I did talk about the 150th anniversary, and it's, it's a great time to bring together the past, present staff and students. And I'll talk a little bit later, but when we finish, about if you haven't joined the Royal Alumni, we'd be so grateful if you do join up, and it's a free membership. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, um, once, once we share all this fascinating history, and I'm sure that you know, there's probably opportunities for um, some of our members here, some of our audience to actually write some memoirs. Um, we we're talking about that just outside. So that will be some fascinating, fascinating reading. But um, tonight we're just gonna have some history that's taken place, place at this campus um, and the people that have laid the foundations for us to create a world-class institution. Now I'm gonna introduce uh, our first speaker, Professor John Pern. Um, now, I'll, I'll, before I go through his fascinating, you know, what he's done, um, we actually know each other. And I'm gonna take you back to the year 2004, um, through when we had the tsunami in Banda Aceh, the Indonesian tsunami, where there was a team that was deployed from Queensland to go over and assist. Now, part of that team, I've, Barry Lockham was part of that team as well, but John Pern was part of that team and so was I. Now, John Pern um, was a, a great sort of mentor to us um, for the whole team. He was the oldest in the team. I know I keep bringing up about the age, but it just goes to show the wisdom and how much support he provided us during that 10 days or so that we were there. And I remember a fascinating speech that he gave to us on Australia Day. So if, this, if I remember the speech that he gave to us those many years ago, um, this is gonna be a great um, opportunity. So I'll just give you a little bit of um, information about our Professor John Pern. So he's a major general, Professor John Pern. I've got to read it out because there's quite a few great points about um, Professor John Pern. AO is an internationally recognized pediatrician, author, and teacher. John is Professor of Paediatrics and Child Health at the University of Queensland and holds triple high doctorates in medicine, science and philosophy. He was appointed Surgeon General for the Australian Defence Force back in 1998 after 36 years with the Army Reserve, during which time he served in PNG, Vietnam and Rwanda, among others. 
In addition to his role as a military doctor, John established the first hospital genetics uh, clinics in Queensland at the Royal Children's Hospital and the Royal Women's Hospital back in 1974. He's well known for fighting for safety legislation for children, swimming pool fencing, bubble packaging for drugs and car restraints, just to name a few. In um, 2016, John pre was presented a top award from the Queen, the King Edward VII Cup, for his work in preventing child drown drownings. Absolutely fascinating. John joins us tonight to share another one of his big passions, and that's history. He's co-published 52 books on history and medicine, and tonight will present his incredible knowledge of our local area, the origins of Hurston beneath our feet. And please welcome <laughs> Professor John Pern. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Tammy Fotinus, our chair and uh, colleagues of the alumni of this uh, wonderful hospital. So many personal friends uh, in the audience and uh, colleagues who identify as this place uh, in our various uh, different professional li lives in times past. It's often said that the perhaps the most two important questions in life are where have we come from on the one hand and where are we going on the other? And all of us who identify with uh, this complex here, of course, uh, often think about where we've come from, literally what is uh, beneath our, our uh, feet. And uh, in this regard, in just a minute, I might need some help here, Kelly. That's fine, thank you. Um, in this regard, uh, I thought I'd share with you, and just in these few brief moments together, uh, a little bit about the the heritage of our, our hospital, where we've, co we've, we've come from, and what went before. On this site, there have been seven different hospitals or independent uh, units. And on this site, of course, have trained more, we think, than 100,000 nurses, more than 15,000 doctors, uh, many millions of patients have been treated on this Hurston Healthcare campus with the hospitals uh, in, this, uh, in this area. And of course, uh, many, many hundreds of thousands of families identify with this place as a place of final repose of lo loved ones who spent their last hours in this, uh, in this place. So with this uh, identity, we identify uh, w with it. And it's helpful sometimes just to look back and see what really is beneath our feet. We're here, as you can see, uh, I've marked there the, uh, the medical school here, but we're here and this whole complex uh, here is very, very rich in, rich in history. The history that we have uh, uh, in, in, inherited uh, either because of our love uh, of this place, because of our former service, in various ro roles in many of the healthcare prof professions, in logistic service here, in secretarial service, nursing, medicine, allied he health, scientific service, engineers, gar gar gardener gardeners, and, uh, and all the rest. We all identify with this uh, special place. I'd just like to go back and answer the question, what is it beneath our, our feet? And beneath our feet here, is, was an originally a deep-sided Permian uh, gully here some 280 million years ago. That gully was steep-sided, we know. It stretched from uh, up uh, about where Caboolture is today, down past uh, the, Logan River, the Logan River, and uh, gradually over the ensuing millions of years, it became filled with those uh, early um, uh, Triassic uh, plants and life. It was a deep-sided valley that was here right beneath our, our feet. It was full of swamps and there were masses of insects and dragonflies uh, above it in dense swarms. There were horsetails and uh, cordites, uh, tree ferns of uh, two or three uh, species long since ex extinct. Uh, and in the swamps were primitive amphibians and fish and very early proto-dinosaurs. We know them from their, their tracks that, that were here. And then something happened uh, on one fateful day uh, 232 million years ago. 
There were rumblings of uh, volcanoes just, uh, just north of here, uh, in the area south of uh, Caboolture. And on one fateful day, one of those volcanoes started to spew out lava. And then at some particular point, there was a massive volcanic explosion. Geologists estimate that they, that explosion uh, had the energy and intensity of perhaps two and possibly three Hiroshima atomic bombs. And a massive uh, cloud of dust, every rock was pulverised to fine dust. As some residual small blocks, rocks were blown many kilometres into the air and everything surged down that prehistoric steep ride, steep walled Triassic val Valley incinerating everything in its path. It filled up that, that valley, uh, the glowing cloud of glowing volcanic dust settled, and over the ensuing months it, uh, it cooled and it settled and it gradually solidified. And it solidified into a rock called Ignimbrite, which uh, uh, quarry masters in the last 140 years have, have quarried, and we recognise this beautiful building stone today. And as we enter our hospital here, we see it in the magnificent feature wall that's been, that's been built, made of, this, uh, made of this stone. Now how, you might ask, uh, does one know it was 232 million years ago? Well, when the Northern Brusway was being surveyed and drill cores were being set, put down in 1994, a sample of the rock was sent to a very sensitive machine in Canberra, called the shrimp, shrimp machine, machine, the sensitive high resolution iron microprobe. And it measures the ratio between uh, uranium and lead. And with incredible accuracy, it can date the zircon crystals in that, ro that rock to an accuracy of plus or minus 1%. So some 232 million years ago, plus or minus, one million year, years, this all, this, all, this all happened, and it formed the bedrock on which we're standing and on which, uh, below with which many of us have served in decades gone by. And that rock uh, went down and it, uh, it went uh, far south. It... It uh, formed the building rock of uh, many of the features of Brisbane. As many of you will recognise this beautiful stone. It's called Ingham, Ing Ignimbrite, or Brisbane Tough. It's only the most expensive houses, of course, that can afford this rock now, but it was quarried, of course, on this, uh, on this site. And what happened was that the uh, uh, rock cooled, as I've said, it solidified, and then over the eons, the iron and the manganese in the rock gradually became oxidised to produce these, uh, these beautiful colours. And we know that there are many of these rocks which are purples and uh, greens, browns, pinks and various colours of ochre. And many of you will recognise this beautiful light stand at the corner just up the road here, some 300 metres away, at the corner of Gregory, Gregory Terrace and Brunswick, uh, Brunswick Street. But if we have a look carefully in the rock, and this is a rock from the children's hospital here on this site, we can just make out fragments of that life that teemed here in this valley beneath our, our feet those many millions of years ago. And here's a little bit of carbon fragment, perhaps from a tree fern or from a, a, one of those organic plants that was growing here, which has survived and which gives a clue to that very rich living biota, which was the teeming life on this particular site. Over the eons, the rock settled, dust came on the top, plants grew in the rock, dust from wind storms covered this, uh, this place. And then uh, a million, one and a, a million, 130 million years later, the first flowering plants appeared. I've shown this example of one of those first flowering plants a hundred year, million years ago on this site. This is uh, Eucalyptus pilularis. And pilularis is a botanical pun. It means a little pill. And when the architects were building the wonderful oral health building, which was opened, as you know, 18 months ago on this Hurston 
healthcare campus just over Bramston Terrace in the, former, in the grounds of the medical school here as part of this extended healthcare campus, campus. The architects again wanted to continue that botanic pun and all the internal uh, work of that was, ta was done from this particular tree to make a medical and a dental pun, a little pill uh, from the, the site there. Well, um, fast forward, of course, and we know that now 50 or 60,000 years ago, our Aboriginal forebears came down through the New Guinea Cape York land bridge at that time and came throughout Australia. But uh, at that time, all this area was covered, it had become covered in, in water. But some 6,000 years ago, the water started to recede, leaving only some tracks. A channel had been carved down, which is now the Brisbane River. Another residual channel had carved down, which is Breakfast Creek, a residual channel there. But there are there some chains of water holes in Victoria Park, just two or 300 metres here from the south of where we're sitting th this evening. And our Aboriginal forebears came into this, uh, into this, this place. And uh, one of Brisbane's most beautiful statues is one of the billabongs just down here off Gilchrist Ave Ave Avenue as a portrayal and an acknowledgement of the forebears in this place. I regard this as one of Brisbane's most significant uh, uh, statues. And as you can see, it's a joyful um, manifestation of a, an initiation ceremony. These two young boys just entering adolescence here are holding up amethyst geodes. Those of you who've travelled up to Mount Tambourine may have seen the geode farm there and seen the beautiful amethyst crystals in them. But the, uh, the elders of the, uh, the uh, Bubental people here who were here, they were a hunting group of the Yugara people in this part of southeast Queensland, um, uh, speaking a common language, partly cognate with the Yoronga people of South Brisbane, with the Kabentpils of Bribe Island, with the Ningi of um, uh, Bribe Island, and uh, they lived in this place. We know that the hunting range of the those forebears who were on this site um, in, uh, encompassed this entire part of Brisbane, from the Brisbane River through to, but limited to, um, Breakfast Creek. And uh, I just show this slide not only to show this very important statue in Brisbane, which is really just a few hundred metres from where we are uh, tonight, in one of the billabongs, still residual, in Victoria, uh, Victoria Park. But it's the portrayal of life, the giver of, he of health, the rainbow ser ser serpent. Uh, and I illustrate this just to link us all together in that for some inexplicable reason, all the symbols of medicine throughout the world, in South and Central Amer Amer America, the, um, the bearded serpent in Chinese and Oriental history, the dragon as the, the great giver of life, in the Western medical tradition, the Aesculapian uh, serpent in Babylonian medicine, of course, the, uh, the dragon, and of course, in our Aboriginal peoples here, the giver of life, the rainbow uh, serpent. So that the Aboriginal people were here, they exploited this land, but they did not despoil it. And they hunted here uh, in their hunting range here from uh, about 6,000 uh, years ago until about 140 years ago when they were displ displaced. I was privileged to work with the late Dr. David Brand on the, uh, the beautiful Bering Armorial, which is our very proud crest of the Royal Brisbane and Women's uh, Hospital. And uh, acknowledgement was made in that crest uh, to the Aboriginal history of medicine in this place and on this uh, site, perhaps extending back 6,000 years. And here again, we see that same rainbow serpent. We see uh, David and I put in here, instead of the Aesculapian serpent, you can see the local black st uh, snake, um, Sudecus porphyriacus, the crown, of course, for Royal Brisbane. We used the Stafford knot, the symbol of Brisbane, he here as in the emblem of Sir Thomas Brisbane and his regiment, which had the emblem of the second South Staffordshires. Um, and uh, we see here, in heraldic terms, 
Uh, the North Brisbane Hospital, as it was then, in heraldic terms, this is the right side as we see it, the Dexter supporters here and the Sinister supporters here, and you can see the right side rather here, and you can see the hospital is here on the right side or the north side of the, of the river. But I just wanted to highlight here in the, uh, when the College of Arms in London in uh, 1981 bestowed these bearings armorial on their submission here, we acknowledge we included these two objects here. And these objects here are objects which are found in the medical bag of the traditional healers in a number of our tribal forebears amongst the indigenous people of Australia. And in a little dilly bag, an Aboriginal healer would often have a magic stone, a crystal, as you can see here, held in the talon of the rainbow, ser rainbow serpent, the feathers here as a, perhaps as a, some sort of mace or bestowal. And here are two tectites. This is a tectite. This is a little stone. Some of you may have picked up a stone occasionally with geological properties such that it rattles. There's another stone inside. And these were regarded as healing, uh, healing stones. So these emblems here are an acknowledgement of those Aboriginal forebears who were here uh, in those uh, early times. Incidentally, this is the local corkwood tree, Dubuisia myoparoides, three quarters of the world supply of hyacinth and scopolamine comes from within 200 metres of, 200 kilometres of Brisbane where we are now, grown uh, in um, uh, plantations. The leaves are harvested and sent to Boringa in German where uh, the anti-emetic drugs, quells, those of us who use patches for seasickness, are using uh, scopolamine or hyacin or hyacyamine, which comes from very near here. And that's this plant here in our hospital crest. And of course, the finger cherry here, a poisonous plant, uh, which um, has a big history in its own right. I just thought I'd uh, uh, perhaps over long highlight the importance of our Aboriginal forebears here. This is the, uh, the tree. It's a beautiful lemon myrtle, which was planted by the governor of Queensland. It's uh, Bacchousia citriodoria, a beautiful lemon-scented metal. Some of you may use its leaves in, in, uh, in cooking, but it was uh, planted in the grounds of this Hurston Health Camp campus at the site of now the former Royal Children's uh, Hospital during the period of recognition of Aboriginal forebears were here. And that's the plaque which we know will be preserved with the redevelopment of the, uh, of the, uh, the Royal Children's uh, uh, Hospital. Well, fast forward then from all that, uh, that time, again answering the question, uh, beneath our feet, the heritage of this place. And this is the map from 1826 from Lieutenant Sterling, an engineer of the 40th Regiment of Foot, who was here with the convict party and the open air garrison and jail, which was, uh, was Brisbane. You will recall that in, in August 1824, the first, uh, the Abbey moored here, 50 people landed here. Lieutenant Henry Miller and his wife, 12 soldiers, five of them with wives, and some seven children, and 30 convicts, all volunteers in that first par party and skilled tradesmen in their own right. The, at Humpy Bong, the water pollution failed and Lieutenant Henry Miller decided with great wisdom that he would transfer the open air jail here up the mouth of the Brisbane River some 10 miles upstream uh, here. And this is where we are today on this 1820-25 uh, uh, map. I just wanted to highlight this also just for interest. You'll see here that it says here Eden Glassy Settlement. And some of you will remember from school days that this part before Brisbane was called Brisbane circa 1836, 1837. It was called for a number of years, initially the Boughton Bay Settlement, and then for a short period of time, Eden Glassy. Very rarely appearing on maps, but it, it, is, uh, it is there. So the hospitals were set up here, and if we fast forward now to 1888, we see here, I've oriented this map so that uh, north is to the uh, to the to the to the uh, the top, and you can see uh, up uh, here a uh, proposed site of our hospital where we're sitting tonight. This was proposed, of course, in 1885, uh, uh, year before, two years before our, our hospital moved uh, from North Quay 
to, uh, to uh, here. But over the road from the hospital was the well-established Queensland acclimatisation garden. So that's where we are today. That's as it was in 1885. You can see Brisbane town is, uh, is all here around the central district district. A few tracks going out here and the first land subdivisions starting out here along Coronation Drive to the, to the west. But uh, the Queensland Acclimatisation Society was established, subsequently called Bowen Park after our first, uh, first governor. And uh, this is the beautiful park outside the door here, immediately over the, uh, over the road. Many of us used to enjoy having our lunch sitting in that, uh, in the, in, in that, uh, in that uh, park. And my dear friend, Dr. Patrick Marnie, is smiling now, remembering many occasions when we uh, would take our lunch uh, out and snatch 20 minutes from being busy residents here over the road in the, uh, in the park. And there it is, uh, Bowen Park. There, those of you who haven't walked in the park, it's, uh, it's worth a look. It's a very important part of Brisbane's heritage and it's a very significant part of this Hurston Healthcare camp campus. Here it is uh, today, very beautiful park, and there are still some residual plants from the Acclimatisation Society. When they established it here in the early 1860s, they introduced uh, trees, they introduced animals, pheasants and deer. The deer that occasionally are seen in Kenmore Gardens nibbling the roses today are descendants of the deer that were in uh, Bowen Park, the, the Queensland Acclimatisation Society here. They introduced pheasants, but very importantly, they introduced tropical fruits and the entire Queensland tropical fruit industry had its origins within 50 metres, again, of where we're standing in the park over the road. They extended, of course, to the islands of Moreton Bay, to the district of Red, what's called Redlands today, but it all started here. And here is the two of the residual beautiful uh, hoop pines, probably still uh, young trees here when our hospital was founded in 1867. They're named after Alan Cunningham, Araucaria Cunninghamii. And this was the um, citation for the foundation of that Queensland acclimatisation society. It uh, introduced sugar canes from India and from Papua New Guinea, introduced uh, custard apples and all sorts of uh, introduced fruits to see if they would grow here. Many animals, many of which have not survived, and, it, and I'm sad to say introduced, of course, rabbits as well at that time. And this is the uh, plan of that, uh, of that time. And I just wanted to show this uh, slide here because this was the plan of the Acclimatisation Society. Here we are tonight over the road here, just across the, the road. But if you have a look at the names here, there are Bernays. We have a vision here tonight, uh, here as one of the trustees, but very importantly indeed, Joseph Bancroft, who was the, the best known and leading medical scientist in Australia. Uh, here as in the hospital in the, uh, in, the 19th in the 19th century. This was up the road, was the uh, estate which was going to become the exhibition grounds. And again, we see the trustees with these famous names who are our earliest neighbours here. And uh, Sir Samuel Griffith, who drafted the Australian constitution, is, is there again, uh, identifying himself in there as one of, his, one of our early neighbours. Well, this is what uh, Bowen Park just over the road looked like when our hospital was founded. It was very beautiful. Uh, you can see here the uh, ornamental ponds, the beautiful plants, the fountains that were there. And these were four statues representing the four seasons, spring, summer, autumn and, uh, and uh, winter, winter. Sadly, with the heritage destruction that has occurred in Queensland, this is all gone, of course, now. And this is the park, uh, Bowen Park, uh, today. Still a beautiful park, still with these occasional r relics of that, uh, of that uh, former time. A beautiful camphor laurel tree here introduced again as a, as a, uh, as a species, still extant, extant there. But uh, when a hospital came here and the area started to extend, the um, Queensland Acclimatisation Society decided they would have to move and they went up there to North Pine. You can see this here dated in the year that a hospital was uh, established 
here, they decided that they would extend, knowing that at some time in the future, Brisbane would extend and uh, they would have to go. So they're up at, uh, they went up to where Moray Field is today. There's no, almost no heritage remnant left there of the Queensland Acclimatisation Society, except this tiny little park. And I've identified this on the spot from um, uh, uh, early records and town uh, ma maps. But uh, it's interesting to walk on there and think that there were masses of custard apples grown up there in trial pots. There were masses of grapes. Uh, new species of wheat were, try were tried right there. Sugarcane was tried there as well, as it was, uh, as it was uh, here. So moving on, we see now, uh, again, I've um, oriented this map so that uh, north is, uh, is up here. You can see Bowen Park is here, but now uh, our hospital has been established and beside it there's been a site set aside for the um, Royal Children's Hospital. Now this area here wasn't called Hurston in those days, it was called O'Connell Town. Uh, because two wonderful people established their farm here, Sir Morris O'Connell and his wife, Lady O'Connell, the, the former, former Gloria Teague, who's shown here. And my colleagues from the um, Queensland Women's Historical Association have done so much to uh, promote the very significant importance of Lady O'Connell in the history of this place and of, uh, and of Queensland. So Morris O'Connell and Lady O'Connell, his, his wife, established a beautiful 11-acre farm just over the road here, which they called Rosemount. And of course, many of you all know that Rosemount, it remains today. During the Second World War, of course, it became a military hospital. It's been an orthopaedic hospital since that time and many other uses as well. But it was the name of the farm established by the O'Connells. Sir Morris O'Connell was acting governor of Queensland. He was a former soldier, senior administrator, the senior public servant in Queensland. And on many uh, occasions, he stepped forward as the civic leader in, in Queensland. At a time of great strife, particularly during Governor Chelmsford time here, when there was a march of many hundreds of people with breathing hooks and so on, which marched on Government House at the bottom of George Street, Sir Morris O'Connell stepped, fo stepped forward again on that occasion. Lady O'Connell uh, and Sir Morris had no children, but she was uh, a leader in good works. She was a leader in what became the Queen Queensland Women's Temperance uh, Society. She was a, uh, a founder and a leader in the Lady Bowen Obstetric Hospital. She was on the original committee and then the chair for 21 years of the Hospital for Sick uh, children here here in Brisbane and many other other good works beside. This is her in her senior years here, uh, and her uh, memorial uh, is no longer in the name of this suburb, which is now lost, but it's in the name of O'Connell Terrace, which used, of course, pass through our hospital grounds uh, grounds here. Now, um, what happened was in the uh, 1860s, two of uh, Queensland senior public servants. Um, Robert uh, Herbert and John Bramston, who were very close friends, established a farm or bought, bought extensive lands here on this site. And as you can see, uh, this is a, a map of land ownership in the 1860s. You can see Jay Bramston there. You'll see other names up here, famous names. Wickham, who owned uh, a lot of land here. And of course, Mr, uh, Mr. David O'Connell, the very rich grazier from Tugulawa and um, uh, the house at Belimba, Belimba House, all these famous names owned land in this area, but particularly on this site, uh, uh, the original land owner was um, Robert uh, Herbert, who went on to become, of course, Queensland's first Premier, and his very close, close friend, Captain John Bramston. He was a soldier uh, and he was a secretary in the department. These two were very close friends and they bought in their joint names a house which is just at the end of the Hurston Healthcare campus he here and they established their 15-acre uh, farm which they called as a manifestation of their deep affection for each other uh, with a conjoint joining of their two names. 
Herbert and Bramston, and they conjoined that to name their farm Hurston Farm. And today, uh, the suburb of Hurston, of course, is the is the memory of their enduring friendship. Herbert went on to be um, the Premier of Queensland. Bramston went on, of course, to be a uh, senior public, very senior public service servant, a return to uh, Britain where he had a very distinguished career as well. And this is their farmhouse. It's the only known surviving, very poor, uh, multiply reproduced photograph of Hurston House. It's just off, those of you who know, the back entrance to our hospital here is McLeod Street. And it was uh, in that site there on the very high, high ground. They lived together, the two men in this uh, in this house. They had orchards all around the house. They had cattle here. And there's one surviving letter from Mr. Herbert describing how they enjoyed their house and the farm ar around it and the fowls that had taken up residence in their kitchen from their, from their farm as well. Now, I just wanted to um, highlight the point that our hospital here until 1824, of course, as were, as was the hospital for sick children and the Lock Hospital on this site were all charity hospitals. That, what, that means that um, people, or doctors particularly, could subscribe, pay, get patients to pay a subscription, and then those patients could be admitted to, this, to these hospitals on this, uh, on this site. But there was a problem with the hospital being here, and uh, this is the map of Brisbane in 1889. This is the central Brisbane district with Victoria Bridge uh, here, of course, South Brisbane over here, busy Brisbane scene. This is uh, Queen Street down here. And of course, our hospital is this, those little buildings right up there. I just highlight that point as a paediatrician and uh, somebody, of course, that uh, served for 45 years as a paediatrician on this on hospitals, children's hospitals on this site. And indeed, this hospital is the Brisbane Hospital on this site. Uh, until 18, until 1901, there were no cars here. So mothers with sick children had to carry a sick child up here, up over Gregory Terrace, across up here to this hospital site. And those that couldn't afford to hire a dray or couldn't be carried on a horse or couldn't afford a horse had to walk from this area to the hospital site, site there. Rich people, of course, were treated in their own home, generally by their own, uh, by their own uh, doctor. So again, moving forward, this is our, our hospital site, a site and a, and a picture well known to, uh, to many of us uh, here. Uh, I mentioned there were seven hospitals have existed on this site. Uh, one of the saddest is in fact the Lock Hospital. That's this building here, and you can see it's surrounded by a barbed wire fence enclosed in a, a hedge to mask the, gar, the barbed wire. These were mainly prostitutes, but women who uh, had venereal disease, who by law and by the influence of the leading medical men of the day were incarcerated by law in that lock hospital. A very tragic uh, pattern of history. Men were not incarcerated with venereal disease, but women were at that, at that stage. There's uh, some extent documentation when the Lady Lamington nursing home was built here uh, about the nurses, how inappropriate it was for nurses to walk up from the hospital up the hill here past the Lock Hospital. It was re regarded as a bit challenging at that time. This is the, uh, the fever hospital here. Uh, these are the doctors, one of the doctor's quarters here. This is the mort mortuary here, which expanded. Many of us who did pathology here will know that that was expanded much, much to much uh, larger area. This is Hurston Road. This is Brunswick Street uh, here. But uh, this is all now gone, of course, uh, but it's part of a very proud uh, he heritage. This is the land. It's built, the hospital was built on the site of what was called the, uh, the quarries. And of course, those of us who go outside will know and see the quarry walls here all uh, around us. With the ignimbrite, that beautiful tuff, still in the, in the, the wall where it was, uh, where it was uh, quarried. If we move forward to the uh, more the uh, 20th century, we can see here that in 1883, the Hospital for Sick Children was moved from Warren Street 
in Fortitude to, to Valley to this uh, site here. But we can see there's still no Bramston Terrace here. There's still no Butterfield Street uh, yet, uh, extending beyond uh, here. Breakfast Creek is here. But by this stage, all the Aboriginal people whose encampments in Brisbane had been centred around this area here, known as York's Hollow, had been displaced by 1868 across Breakfast Creek and by, by the 1890s uh, uh, north uh, to the North, uh, the north uh, Pine region as, uh, as well. Incidentally, the, uh, the hunting group, the tribal group of Aboriginal people here was always known as the Duke of York's tribe. That was, we think, uh, either a disparaging name or just a metaphoric name it said the first record to the that name describing our Aboriginal forebears of, of here was given by Commander Fyans, who was the commandant of the open air jail of Garrison, the open uh, the still in Brisbane until 1842, and he for the first time uh, wrote the words in a do surviving document, the Duke of York's tribe, that was here, and it was th it's said by oral history that one of the tall elders of the tribe had a fanciful resemblance in the soldier's eyes or, or the the convict's eyes to the Duke of York, the grand old Duke of York. He was a tall, regal man. We don't know the origins of it, but they were displaced. But since that time, this area here was known as York's Hollow, as it is today, where those um, uh, uh, buildings are. Well, of course, um, the other hospital on this site is the uh, hospital for Sick Children, later the Brisbane Ho Children's Hospital, later the Royal Children's Hospital. It was founded by a meeting chaired by Mrs Mary McConnell in a workplace in the old and the first exhibition buildings, now on this site uh, here. And uh, the hospital was built on this site in 1883. Just note the, out the format of this building. This beautiful painting, watercolour, by Joan Ricketts, was commissioned by the graduating class of medical students in 1981 and presented to the hospital as a wonderful, enduring gift. And that, that was written from this photograph here. And you can see again that original, that's the building, the original Children's Hospital. So this is 1905. This is the Children's Hospital. Here is Hurston Road, still, of course, a dirt track. Here is the early Bramston Terrace, part, part of that. Here is the... Uh, Lady Norman Wing, still extant, which is now under a heritage preservation order. Here's the Lady O'Connell um, Wing, now destroy destroyed. Uh, here is the site of the Grey Collie Cottage, which in 1961 became the home of the university for three years, the University Department of Child Health, also destroyed tragically in the heritage destruction that's occurred. Well, what was the life like here in this suburb? formerly O'Connell Town, more latterly Hurston. Well, it was a mixture. On the high ground, as had happened throughout Brisbane, rich people had their houses. This is a, uh, a, a picture of Ballymore House with the, with the family there, very wealthy and rich family, highly privileged uh, children, as you can see. And here is Hun Stanton, built in 1906, now the AMA headquarters up the road in Lestrange Terrace. Again, very high, grand houses, on the high ground, as has occurred elsewhere in uh, in Brisbane, and of course, um, the Wellesley Hospital site on Moorlands was another example of that. But uh, because of the kindness of Mrs. Diana Hacker and Don H Hacker, professional historians themselves, I show this slide uh, here. This is a young hacker living here in Butterfield Street. Um, Diana uh, here in Hairston, and this was like, these were the typical cottages that were all around this, this part of the world, on the lower ground, all along but, uh, what's now Brunswick Street, all along Hurston Road, Butterfield uh, Street, in this whole area. A typical house, a, a, a kitchen, working class uh, families, many Im Im impoverished, and these were the families that particularly were the patients of the hospital on this site. Now, my time is up, so I'll uh, finish here, but I just wanted to finish by again coming back to our very proud hospital crest and pointing out the, uh, the seven Maltese crosses that form part of the hospital crest. These, of course, represent the state emblem of, of uh, Queensland, but one may ask, 
Why seven? And the reason is that there were, when the crest was approved by the College of Arms in London, when it was um, bestowed, I should say, the College of Arms, the Herald, when I went over there as part of all this bestowal of arms, he was very iffy. He said, you don't apply for arms, we bestow them. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, they did agree to complete these. And these are the seven hospitals, which were part then of the North Brisbane Hospitals Board. So all the hospitals uh, have a right to this crest, not only our Royal Brisbane Women's Hospital today, the Royal Brisbane Hospital, the Hospital for Sick Children, the Royal Children's Hospital, the Royal Women's Hospital, now incorporated, of course, into our uh, hospital, the Metropolitan Hospital for Infectious Diseases, always known as Wattlebrae, and a part, functional part of our hospital, but in fact, administratively, quite a totally distinct hospital with a different budget and partly funded by the Brisbane City Council because of infectious diseases with their, an historical public health uh, history. Uh, the Locke Hospital, tragic hospital that I've, uh, that I've mentioned. The Queensland Radium Institute, founded in 1944. And again, although part of this hospital was an independent uh, hospital unit within a hospital. And interestingly, Kilcoy Hospital here, which was again part of the, uh, the Royal uh, Children's Hospital Board. And that, uh, that badge uh, endured. Queen Victoria, who, as she said in her letters patent, was proud to bestow our name on our state of, of uh, Queensland and to sew the emblem of the Maltese Cross, which, with which she identified because of the tradition of the uh, hospitalers giving hospital care to the Crusaders. And uh, from 1959, that morphed into the North Brisbane Hospitals Board, again, with the Crusader Cross as the, the emblem. Well, my time is up. I won't have time to do any of these other things, these precious heritage things that are part of our hospital here. But um, uh, I'd just like to finish by saying, this is our hospital as it was 15 years ago. This is our hospital as it was. Uh, until the Northern Busway went through. This is the, an aerial view, particularly of the western end of the Hurston Healthcare Complex. But we know that the nursing towers, which are most important part of Brisbane, uh, uh, will be pre uh, preserved in the new ho hospital plan. And uh, this proud, indeed, uh, streetscape, which uh, incorporates so much of the history of the past, which is beneath our, our feet, endures in our minds, in our, in, our, in our memories, and the love that we have of this very special place. Thank you all. Well, wasn't that absolutely fascinating? And I think um, we will need to bring you back because I think we'll need to finish off um, that slide series. Um, because, yes. Because um, it, was, it was very engaging and the time went quite quickly. And, you know, when I was growing up in school, I didn't actually, history wasn't a very strong subject because I liked the chemistry and the physics and sports. But I think I have some regrets because I found that absolutely fascinating. And as you get older, you do actually like to know a little bit more about the history. Thank you so much for that. And I think if we have some um, time at the end, we might actually have some questions if there's any sort of burning questions. So, um, right, so now we have our next speaker. Um, we've got Associate Professor Cliff Pollard. Now, I do know Cliff. And so, um, Cliff, we went to the same school, Brisbane State High. He went there century, I mean, a few years before me. <laughs> and. Um, um, yes, and Cliff and I did actually make a video together, and um, <laughs> it was a video for the College of Surgeons. So I was working, I work for the College of Surgeons as well as a EMST coordinator, and Cliff was one of the facilitators. So when I say yes, I made a video with Cliff, there's some very sort of strange looks. But I don't think that video is actually, it was a video for the, the um, EMST trauma courses and so um, you know um, it was quite a lot of fun and Cliff and I have a lot of banter regarding because my background is Greek and um, I know Cliff 
grew up and went to school with a lot of Greeks, but I do say to him, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. So, and then the conversation ends. So we have friendly banter, but I do respect my elders, Cliff. But let, let's just let everyone know how fabulous you are and that you are a retired surgeon and you are you were the director of the RBWH Trauma Service from 2008 until his retirement in 2012. And I know we've got Daryl Wall who's taken over. Um, your, your major interest is in all aspects of trauma, trauma management in both pre-hospital and hospital environments and has presented widely on this topic. You're a member of the Australian Army Medical Corps and you have been deployed um, to East Timor as one of, one of those areas. Um, you're a member of the Metro North Hospital and Health Services Board and very active member and you are also the chair of the Royal Alumni Committee. You're an examiner in general surgery for the College of Surgeons and you continue to teach the anatomy for um, UQ School of Medicine. Now, in your presentation, Cliff, and for everyone, you will be looking back at a quite a tumultuous time at the Royal's fascinating history, namely um, 1917. So at this time, the Brisbane Hospital was dealing with the impact of World War I, major financial difficulties and resignation of the hospital board. And for several months during 1917, there were no um, resident medical officers. They were all um, enlisted and there were very few experienced nurses because of many of the senior nurses has also, have also enlisted in that time. So we're gonna welcome Cliff now to give us a indication of those years. So I think. We did go to State High together. Um, and let me tell you, it's quite a few years uh, between Tammy and me, and um, there, were, there were a lot of um, Greek kids there, and uh, they all had respect for their elders. Uh, it's, it's a slightly different world now, but it's a great, it's a great pleasure to present this uh, talk. At Brisbane in, in 1917, there were 165,000 people. So if you look at the hospital then, about 1900, and John's already covered some of this, but first of all, the very first building was the tower block there. And uh, if you remember that, that was uh, downstairs was the wards, upstairs was the nurses' accommodation. That would change very quickly because it was thought that they would only need 100 beds, but very quickly they needed 300 beds. They needed to build further accommodation for the nurses. There was a building beyond that before the Lady Lamington was built. That outpatients building came uh, fairly early in the piece, and then the Porter's Lodge you can see there, and then of course the fever wards which were built during the 1870s to 1880s, when typhoid uh, fever was a very common problem within the um, colony at that stage. And then of course the Lady Lamington up the top, and the architect for that was Robin Dodds, the brother of Joseph S. B. Dodds, who, who was government medical officer, served in World War I and in the Boer War, and sadly, in 1930, he took his own life, probably, we think, because of the effect of Pozieres when he was the medical officer caring for the some, some 7,000 Australian casualties in that campaign. And John's pointed out nicely the lock hospital up there. You can see close to where the nurses walked by. Then the new outpatient building was opened in 1917. In 1911, the hospital committee borrowed £10,000 from the government. And in 1913, that was increased to £30,000. They still had a debt of £10,000 from 1906. And in 1915, without really any understanding of what difficulties were coming, they extended that £30,000 to £35,000. That was to build that new outpatient building, to provide hot water, steam for the hospital buildings, to extend the Lady Lamington, and also to provide electricity for that new outpatients block. By the start of 1970, the, um, the electricity still wasn't there. But if you look, um, Walter Russell Hall Operating Theatre, in 1912, uh, Walter Russell Hall, he was the major shareholder and executive of um, Mount Morgan Gold Mining, and he, uh, his trustees rather, would give £3,000 to the hospital to build uh, the operating room, provided the government subsidised it with, again, £3,000. That happened, and the Walter Russell operating Hall Operating Theatre was opened in 1914. The surgical pavilions, they were built about 1908, 1910. Tremendous in summer, terribly cold in winter, but a great place. And, of course, the fever ward today, remnants, the Museum of Nursing History. But 
If you were here in 1917, this is the Courier Mail, Brisbane Courier, 1st of January. It was a Monday. And if you'd been working in the hospital on the Saturday, you would have looked across at the exhibition ground. The war is all around you at that stage in 1917, the third year of the Great War. So there's reception there for the wounded soldiers, 250. Notice also the matron nurses of the military hospital, Kangaroo Point. Sixth Australian General Hospital was there. That has an effect on the finances of the hospital later on. And if you read on, this is a very interesting, um, go through Trove and have a look at it. The very first two pages of the Brisbane Courier then are advertising. The third page is sport. And then the fourth and fifth pages, you get down to the news. And you can see it's all about the carnage of 1915, Gallipoli, 1916, Fromelles, Pozieres, Moquet Farm. Grief that has stood on the threshold of every door as it now entered many thousands of homes. But if you go on and read this article, it's about patriotism, about altruism, about making the sacrifice, everything for the country. It's couched in these religious terms, the supreme sacrifice of our Lord himself. Okay. The article goes on. Silver lining, the dark cloud of sorrow, cause of freedom and justice. This is our sacrifice. Okay, this is the start of 1917. And then they talk about the heroism. Very interesting. It's more common than the dog licences. I didn't think that there were actually dog licences in 1917. <laughs> Clearly there were. Okay, interesting article to read. Then it goes on. Very far from regretting the sacrifice that we shall never do. But if you read through the, the newspapers of that time, recruiting is dying off. There are very few people presenting to join the army. Okay, many of them are rejected. Remember, the first refer referendum has been defeated. The next one will also be defeated. And this, the attitude of the time. Go through the Western Front today. This is, this is the cemetery at Tyne Cot, major battle in 1917. And it's a different world, isn't it? Very different. All of you who've done this tour, it's just sombre and heart-wrenching. But then you look, same article, this is 1st of January. So support for nurses' equipment fund. The nurses are enlisted. And what I've worked out so far in the Brisbane Hospital, the Hospital for Sick Children, uh, Lady Bowen, La Lady Lamington, to the end of 1917, 179 of our staff or people who'd trained in these institutions had enlisted. There are more to come in 1918. So a huge effect on the hospital. But the nurses, in fact, they had to rely on donations on this fund, on their family, to give them enough money to buy their um, kit, their equipment. And always, every few weeks, the Roll of Honours published. And this was put up in various public places, in railway stations, for example, this Royal of Honour. So the effect of the war, it's all around you. So the 68th Annual Report, Brisbane Hospital, 1916. There's the trustees, James Stoddart, John Hayes. And you notice the four women on it. And the women came onto this committee in 1903. And the committee member who pushed for women coming on was George Herbert Hopkins great-grandfather of George Hopkins, who's currently one of our surgeons here, and Bill Lucan, who works in our emergency department. The family connections, as you look through all these families, go on and on. OK, James Stoddart, member for Logan. He becomes board chair in 1892, following the death the year before of John Petrie. Hayes, mayor of Sandgate. Jessie Jane Buchanan, a little bit more about her in a minute. Uh, Anderson, you can see, is the honorary treasurer of the Queensland Soldiers' Comforts Fund. And there are funds everywhere. The battalions raised in Queensland have their own funds. There's the Queensland Patriotic Fund, the Curia Patriotic Fund. There's the Soldiers' Sock Fund. There's the Hillland Pajama Club, and so on. Huge, huge numbers of people asking the public for donations, as well as the Brisbane Hospital. Thornhill Whedon, Queensland's first government statistician. Important name in Queensland medicine. His son, Cyril Whedon, was a visiting physician and surgeon here. He enlists in 1916. He serves in the Anzac Mounted Division and then comes back and resumes duty here. His grandsons, David and the late Paul Whedon. And A.M. Hertzberg, one of the prominent Jewish members of Australian society, was president of the Chamber of Commerce. 
He'd been on the, the um, hospital committee for quite some time. But the Cannon family, and those of you who are Terrace boys will know the history of um, Joseph David Buchanan. The Buchanan Medal uh, was given to the students doing very well uh, in 1925. And now, as far as I can tell, I think it goes to all the OP1s. But Joseph David Buchanan was in the Light Horse Field Ambulance, served on Gallipoli, comes back to 1AGH in Cairo, and in December, sadly, takes his own life, suffering the PTSD, as we know today, from his effects on Gallipoli. The army did not try to tell the family that this is what had happened. They, they of course, did find out in time. And this shot of the water police, you can see there James Wassell is indicated. He was the treasurer in 1916, and he there is in 1871, his wife is the matron on board the Proserpine. It was a prison hulk moored at Fisherman Island and it just had the, the juvenile criminals. Uh, his son, and I'll talk a bit about his son later on, would also enlist uh, in, in the army in 1914. So if you look at the comparisons, okay, the last time the hospital ran a profit was at the end of 1913 when their credit balance was seven shillings and four pence. Okay, so 1916, the deficit in December, nine and a half thousand pound. Okay, and the subscriptions have dropped off. Now remember the hospital was funded by a base grant, the government giving two to one for all the public subscriptions, they've dropped off. What surprises me, given all the other demands on the public purse, that they haven't dropped off even further. So there's £4,000 there. Inpatients, not so bad. But that's a big loss of income because once the army developed their own hospitals, there was no Commonwealth money coming in to pay for what was 1000 going down to 250 So that was a big loss of income from the hospital. What you have, if you look at the diseases, one of the most common admitted cases is typhoid fever, followed by measles, followed by syphilis, followed by TB, a lot of respiratory diseases and, of course, a lot of alcoholism and a lot of stab wounds for that matter. So, but look at the budget for um, uh, 1916, 80,000 pounds. So the cost of everything is going up because of the war. Now, through 1916, at one day they had 394 patients for a hospital that essentially going to have about 320. So for the average for 1916 was 310 patients. The range is from 250 to 394. What happens? So that's the 13th Australian General Hospital at Inogra, and there was a 6th Australian General Hospital at Kangaroo Point, which would become later the migrant hospital at Yungabar. So the financial position. So the committee, under Mr Stoddart, sent a letter to the Home Secretary. Look, we just need £1,600 to pay wages for February. You know, they're, they're insolvent here, aren't they? And remember also there's a political battle going on in the background between Labor and the Conservatives. Okay, the Secretary of State, the government had paid, we just gave them a thousand pounds. There you go. Dire straits. The government they'd been in trouble before. In 1905, the government had taken over control of the hospital. Only lasted for one year. Again, it's this Labor Conservative battle, caucus tinkering with charitable, as well as other enterprises. So they thought that in June there would be £19,000 down. The government's side stepping its responsibility. And of course other things were happening if you read through the Brisbane Courier. Huge change in Russia, which means that uh, the German forces on the Eastern Front would be transferred to the Western Front. And British take Baghdad. Very interesting to look through all the communiques from uh, Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig Every, he's winning the war on the Western Front. The slaughter of 1917, as you'll see later, hasn't started to affect him, if it ever did. Okay. But one hospital is doing very well. Longreach is really doing very well. And all their board members are reappointed. There you go. Doing very well. Okay. Hospital Bill of 1917. Okay. Labor policy and reaffirmed at their later conventions. Labor comes into power in 1915. So they bring this bill back in 1917 and managed by hospital boards and you saw John put up the 1924 one. Okay, so 
So that two thirds of the cost be paid by the government, the committee would have liked that and would have liked this, this deal, but one third by the local authorities and that's where the legislative council. Okay, different ball game. Okay, the assembly passes the bill. The long, loud, wild, the distressed landlord, we don't want to fund uh, public hospitals. And remember the, the Brisbane hospital was the center, the last post for all of Queensland if you look at the admissions, there are people from all over Queensland and from the northern rivers. It was the poor sick, as John pointed out, the rich were nursed in their own homes, not in the Brisbane Hospital down here. And as we said, alcoholism and destitute patients kept coming in. The Legislative Council did not pass the bill. There you go. Anything bearing the hated brand of labour. So it was a battle. Champion for the squatters, the landlords and the vested interests and beat barons. So what does the committee do? So the government said, we're not going to do anything more. So they, remember, they're looking at the cost of 1917, looking 1916 from that huge budget. How are we going to afford this? Okay. We already have loans from 1911 and from 1906. So they had a meeting with the acting Home Secretary. Remember, there's no health department. You report to the Home Secretary. Okay. So they very polite, thanked him for the meeting. And was this the last word? <laughs> well, it was. Okay. Nothing else. So what did they do? They resigned. 24th of March to take effect from the 31st of March. And the government took control as they could in the statute. So this is gazetted and the government gazette. And the board takes over again in 1924. Remember in 1923 the Legislative Council votes itself out of existence and we've not had an upper house since. There you go. So now Mr Hexham, he's the Home Secretary, he's actually returned. I love this, waiting to get a grip of the whole situation. That's great, isn't it? Get a grip. And of course, the Brisbane Curious supported the committee and the hospital. According to the Home Secretary, things are going well, but what was previously done in a perfunctory way would be done more thoroughly under straight control. There you go. Okay, but what else was happening is there was enormous pressure on doctors and nurses to enlist. And if you look at all the editorials of the MJA in these months, you're getting this message. We need more doctors in the Western Front. We need more nurses. Do the right thing for the empire. In fact, the BMA, there's no AMA, the BMA in Australia actually voted for conscription. Okay. So the call for men. Deplete the junior staffs of the half general hospitals. Too many men cannot apply. And this goes on and on. So wherever you see, go around the campus today, you'll see Effie Jane Bourne, one of the truly great uh, nursing leaders here. Very, very enthusiastic about nursing education. Supported, of course, by the previous doctors, um, Ernest Sanford Jackson, uh, James Main, and John Barr McLean. But she would take over from Grace Wilson, who enlisted, and would be um, succeeded by Kristen Sorensen. The nursing staff was very bottom heavy. But she'd also written to the Nurses' Registration Board and said, look, can you examine our people early so they can join the Australian Army Nursing Service? Here you go. Three doctors, over 300 patients. And we think we work hard. OK, Charles Lilly, Lindsay Brent and Percy Earnshaw. And I learned, learned today that uh, Percy Earnshaw is Graham Cooksley's uncle. So, oh, joins the Army. Charles Lilly. 13th of July, Lindsay Peregrine Brent up the back. Now, the big guy at the back, Lindsay Peregrine, very interesting. When I first looked at his jacket in the um, records, he's a private soldier, and I thought, this is odd. If you go in as a medical officer, you're a captain automatically. But then I looked back, it was 1914. So he interrupted his medical studies, University of Melbourne, joined the Australian Army, went to Egypt, served in 1 AGH in Heliopolis in Cairo, and then they sent them back to finish the medical course. So he comes up here, the court medical courses are shortened, their internship is shortened, and on 24th of October, he goes back into the Australian Army, Australian Army Medical Corps as a captain this time, and goes back and serves on the Western Front. So the effects of the war, what happens? No RMOs from May to September. So the, fortunately, the honorees lend their weight. You've got no doctors. You've got one superintendent. So E.S. Jackson sleeps too. He's back from overseas. Sleeps two nights a week. Very interesting, isn't it? Many of us here in the room have slept overnight in the hospitals. 
Uh, we always feel very proud. What I used to do is, if I wanted to sleep on the theatre, I always make sure I slept on the recovery side. Because if I slept on the other side, someone want, might want to pay me back and haul me into the operating room. So you have to be very careful. But we all think we've done a great job. Hey, someone's done it before us, so he did this. What a, a great leader he was. And the nurses are bottom heavy. The senior nurses have enlisted. Okay. Huge, huge issue. And medical students come. So the, fifth, the course is truncated. They come to take over. Great experience, wouldn't it? And further, two of the nine nurses had enlisted. So Robert Marshall Allen, he comes in as superintendent at that time. Extraordinary. Uh, Brisbane grammar boy, okay, does his degree in Edinburgh, and he's working there in OBGYN. And at the break, outbreak of war, he joins the Royal Army Medical Corps. Has a very distinguished career. Okay. It's a military cross in the Middle East. It's dysentery, probably a maybe, it was very common. Uh, invalid, invalid to India and then turns up in Brisbane uh, where his home was and becomes medical superintendent from May to October until John Barr McLean returns. And what's he do? He re-enlists and goes back to the Western Front. But as a very, after that, he does his FRCS, comes back, works here. But then they want to do a, a big review in, in Victoria of the perinatal and maternity midwifery services in rural and regional Victoria. So he does this review, and it's regarded historically as one of the masterpieces, a great piece of work. Becomes professor of obstetrics, sets up a course, and uh, you can see the other uh, decorations, uh, the other awards and um, degrees he's got. And he's a great rugby player as well, which is very important, obviously, in, um, in getting an FRCS or an FRACS. Okay. John Barr McLean, okay. MBBS Melbourne, starts here. Survives an attack of the bionic plague in 1902. So the medical superintendent for a long period of time, the McLean era. And you know, I can't find an obituary about him in 1943. Nothing's written about him. And 1943, there were dark days for Australia. It would be really good to write something about him, put it in now. But um, in 1AGH in uh, Heliopolis and then um, in he goes to France, 2AGH, becomes CEO and awarded of the DSO, and then returns to Australia. And wherever you see him, in all the photos after that, he was a great teacher of the student nurses, and you see him in all the graduation photos, and he always has a pith helmet. So he and the matron would meet at the fish pond every morning, feed the fish, and then do, he'd do a ward round of 300 patients, and, and as far as I could work out, there were probably about 14, maybe 15, at least wards all around the Hurston site, as John has pointed out. You can see from some of those photos, wards everywhere. Saw everyone. It must have taken hours to do, um, but it was the walk around that he did. Extraordinary character. Okay. And of course, Percy Allen Earnshaw, 8th, 14th Field Ambulances, RMO, Regimental Medical Officer, two, two battalions, gassed in March, 1918, and then Hospital for Sick Children. Without a doubt, one of the founding figures of paediatrics in this state. An enormous number of um, professional qualifications. I've just listed a few there, but uh, uh, a huge impact on medicine in Queensland. And of course, Ernest Sanford Jackson. So he is 21 when he arrives as an intern in the Brisbane Hospital and becomes superintendent at the age of what, uh, well, he's 23, 23, there you go. And he's superintendent until 1898, serves in 1AGH, then is made CO of 2AGH uh, at Manor, and develops pneumonia. And the impact, if you look through the workload, then it's enormous, because they're starting to get in, of course, the wounded and quite sick from um, uh, the Dardanelles campaign. The empire has to be drained, he has to go to the United Kingdom and have that drained, and then returns to Brisbane, Point of 6 AGH at Kangaroo Point, and he would um, start work again in the Brisbane Hospital in January 1916. Uh, 51 years of service to the institution. Now, this, the other family is George Herbert Hopkins. So you see him up there, immigrant, uh, 1892, the degrees, and he comes in 1895. He's a, you can see Errol Sanford Jackson there, Ernest Sanford Jackson over on the far right sitting down. Uh, Alfred Sutton's there in the back at the middle. Charles Ferdinand Marx uh, on the front, uh, second from the left. Enormous history there. But uh, here is George Herbert Hopkins. 
he owned one of the first cars in Brisbane. You can go to the, he was president of the RACQ, he was also president of the United Service Club. And if you go to the RACQ Museum, you can actually see one of his cars. There's his two sons sitting in the back. There they are in uniform. Donald Harold Odo Hopkins and Paul Hopkins. OK, you can see the likeness, can't you? There it is, Paul W. Hopkins, awarded the MC for his actions in 1917, uh, presented in 1919. Comes back, does medicine, general practice in Mackay, and he's, he's, he would have learned urology in our institution, would command the 19th Field Ambulance in New Guinea. Extraordinary history, and there's so many families like this, and I can only touch on a few of them. And Donald Harold Odo, you see him there on the Menin Gate with 6,000 other Australian names the 55,000 names on that gate, the terrible slaughter of 1917. And that's the family tree, George Herbert Hopkins, Paul, the MC, Paul H. Hopkins, FRACS, FRCS, a founding figure in rehabilitation in this hospital and in the state. And George, of course, uh, now works for us, and Bill Lucan works for us, and Genevieve and Alexis uh, have worked for us in the past, but not anymore, a fantastic family. And that's Paul, the late Paul Hopkins, AO, presented in 2000 for his service. Uh, uh, thanks to Peter Slattery for this slide, he's working in the amputee clinic here. But more recently, Motor Accident Insurance Commission have funded a uh, joint uh, Griffith and Metro South uh, Hopkins Centre Research for Rehabilitation and Resilience, named after uh, in honour of Paul Hopkins. And Peter and I and Daryl were at that uh, opening a few months ago. So where were they in 1917? Eleanor Bourne, the very first female resident appointed to this hospital, again with George Hopkins pushing it. Women couldn't join the Australian Army Medical uh, Corps, so they go to England, join the RAMC. She works in the Endell Street Military Hospital, then Queen Mary's uh, Army Auxiliary Corps and becomes a medical controller for Northern England. John Hardy, one of our surgeons, comes back as a surgeon, awarded the MC. He's actually wounded in three places not in two. And of course, Christian Sorensen would be matron here from 1928 uh, through the 1940s. And she would, an enormously um, successful uh, World War I career. She was, became principal matron of the 60th British General Hospital, just had a tremendous reputation. She would be matron here through the depression, through the rebuilding of the 1930s, and of course, the enormous challenges of World War II. Grace Wilson, uh, principal matron 3AGH, for a while she'd be matron in chief of the Australian Army Nursing Service and would be matron in chief from 1925 to 1941. She's the eighth matron of the Alfred Hospital. Now, if you just look at this photo, this is taken probably in Egypt in 1916. Herbert Stewart, one of the physicians, he, re he um, serves uh, at Lemnos and then comes back and uh, is back here in 1916, as is John Lockhart Gibson. But Charles Wassell, the son of James Wassell, the treasurer that I showed you in the um, hospital committee, he is studying medicine in Sydney, enlists in August 1914. At 9.30 on the 25th of April, he lands in Gallipoli and serves there in the first field ambulance Probably got malaria in Gallipoli because he's ill for most of the rest of the war. 1917, you see over the 12th Field Ambulance taking part in the battles of Bullecourt, Messines and Menden Road. He comes back, he's an ear, nose and throat surgeon here. Second World War, he's CEO of the 2nd 9th Australian General Hospital in Palestine, uh, becomes unwell and comes back and sadly passes away about a month or two before the end of the war. Charles Wassell. Charles Lilly? who enlisted there in 1917, comes back, surgeon from 1920 to 1954, senior surgeon from 1930, and an expert, particularly in thyroid surgery. And of course, Errol Solomon Myers. Enlisted in 1916, RMO, 41st Battalion, gas twice, phosgene and mustard gas, and one of the founding fathers of the UQ Medical School. And at that time in the 30s, you have Errol Solomon Myers as surgeons, you have Neville Sutton, uh, you have Charles Lilly, uh, and um, John Hardy is back there as well. So, tough time for the um, Brisbane Hospital in 1917. Tougher time, far tougher time, of course, on the Western Front. There are some of the battles, pretty much all of them. And the Third Battle of Ypres, from 31st of July to the 10th of November, more commonly called Passchendaele, the two battles that the Anzacs took part in, the 9th and 12th, were both terrible defeats. 
uh, and that October was probably, for Australia, the worst month of the whole war, when we lost 19,900 casualties of 6,405 were killed in action or died of wounds. So the hospital staggered on with all this background. In 1920, a hospital advisory committee was formed with the, with the honorees, and then in 1924, as John pointed out, the boards came back. And then, of course, the hospitals are nationalised and um, the financial problems, at least to some extent, were probably over. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Cliff. Well, wasn't that fascinating as well, the trials and tribulations of 1917? And, and you sometimes also think about, you know, history repeating itself when it comes to budgets, political influences, boards, people resigning. But um, I found that fascinating, as I did with um, Professor John Pern's um, also um, talk. Now that actually concludes um, the evening. Um, I'd like to sincerely thank both our speakers again. Please, another round of applause. That was absolutely fascinating. And you know, I, I think we we could listen to them for hours, and um, it might be worthwhile that we bring you back again um, because it was just so fascinating. Thank you again. Um, again, um, thank you to our sponsor QBank for um, sponsoring this great um, night and um, helping the Royal Alumni. And I did mention earlier about please connecting people that are past, present. Um, members of or have worked at the Royal, we do want you to connect. It's a wonderful experience to connect with, um, you know, past people that you've worked with, get to know a little bit more about the history and what's happening into the future. So I think the um, foundation and the committee are very pleased if you do join up or please spread the word about the Royal Alumni. Um, so again, that concludes the formalities. I think, you know, if you want to continue outside and have a little bit more of a chat or some further questions for John and Cliff, um, I'm sure they'd love to take some further questions. Um, is there anything else, Kelly, that you want us to... Okay, so thanks again. Um, I, I really enjoyed it and I, I'd like to thank you for asking me to be the MC. I, I'm very privileged. So thank you. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. going back now. Thank you.